All right, church. Let's find our find our place as we turn to the call of worship this morning. It's uh, going to be Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Isaiah 44, verse 6 through 8. This is God's word. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Let's pray together. Father, there you are not some modern day Goliath who makes claims of deity and yet can be taken down with a sling and a stone. You are God, and you alone are God. And there is no antinomy in this text that suggests that there, that there is some other deity somewhere that we can find. You alone are God. You were there from the beginning, before anything was created. You are both creator and sustainer. And you have on your calendar the day when it will all end. Father, our hearts bow before you as the only God who has made the exclusive claim of deity. The one that can save, comfort, exhort, redeem, preserve. The one who said to us, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify me, the one who sits in the heavens. We are your witnesses. Father, we pray, grant us the Holy Spirit to walk in power. We pray that every opposing spirit, Father, any hindrance to your claim on your people, Father, would be removed, would be taken down, would be overcome by the power and authority of the Word of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'd like to invite you to pray with me. Our Father and God, we thank you for this gospel that's just been sung. We have Savior at your right hand who has poured on us your glorious love, who is before the throne of God above. And in him we have a perfect plea. Our great high priest, whose name is love, has lived and died for me. So, God, in, in light of this great grace and this great truth, we, we confess to you honestly our need. God, we can be so cynical. Uh, we can be so negative. God, we watch far too much news and uh, interpret everything in uh, our, our lives and in the world in, in the light of just the negative and, and cynical outlook of the world. When we have so many treasures in Christ, so much grace in Jesus, we have been loved unfathomably. And so we ask your forgiveness when we make our troubles more real than your grace and your love and your provision. And we ask for uh, joyful hearts. Joyful because we remember this gospel. We remember this truth. We remember this grace of Jesus who has lived and died for me, for us. God, give us a, a love for others in our joy. To love others from a, from a position of absolute amazement at your grace to us. 
Help us to be the uh, to be the sort of people that uh, James in, in James two tells us to be. To have works along with our faith, to have a spirit of generosity and hospitality, not to show partiality. To love those who are even different than us because you have loved us when we could not have been farther from you. God, we pray for those who, um, whom we love but are not among us, uh, whom we love and support in various mission fields across the United States and across the world. We, uh, we pray this morning that the this message of the gospel that we've just sung would also be taken uh, to places like Utah, where Bud and Lois Fuchs are. And we pray that you would empower them and equip them and bless them as they minister to international students, as they share the love of Jesus with people that are coming from other countries for school and have not yet heard of you or certainly not heard of you rightly. I pray for Scott, uh, Scott Zior, uh, who this week is... is um, in the midst of meetings that are designed to train pastors, pastors in India, pastors in Nepal, pastors in Africa. And we pray that you would just empower him and, and equip him and bless him as he pours into those pastors all over the world. We pray for their son, Philip, who's fighting an enduring illness, and I pray that you'd encourage both Scott and Brenda as they try to encourage him and and we just pray for his healing and his strength. God, as we sing and as we sit under your word, we pray that you would lighten our hearts, that you would give us your perspective on all our burdens, and that we would delight in your truth, and we would be equipped for your mission in this world. God, bless our hearts as we, as we give. Help us to do so with gladness and, and generosity and in confidence that you will take our meager gifts and do great things for the spread of your message uh, in this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, as we give, we invite you to do so only as you feel the Lord leads. And uh, you can stand and worship with us when you're ready. Would you join me in prayer? Uh, Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we pray that you would uh, you'd be the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. Uh, we pray that we would give ourselves to this moment, that we would be self-forgetful in all the ways we need to be, mindful of you and your goodness and your glory and your, your son, Jesus. And pray that whatever we need to hear this morning, that you would be merciful and, and faithful to apply just what we need to hear to our hearts. You are a good enough shepherd to do this according to the individual. And so we ask for you to, to do abundantly more than all that we could ask or even imagine as we give ourselves to this word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn in them to John chapter... 20. We're going to read through it in a moment. First, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you about two friends as you're turning to John chapter 20. Two friends named Ronald and Jack. And one night, Ronald and Jack were taking a, a late night stroll. They liked to take long walks together. They were good friends. They'd become fast friends. They had, um, they had so many things in common. They liked all the same books. Um, they had similar professions, similar pastimes, and on these long walks, they liked to enjoy their friendship and, and talk, talk about life, talk about philosophy, talk about theology. Though they were very similar to one another, they did have very different views on God. Ronald was a Christian, a devout Christian, uh, but Jack, Jack had lost his faith long, long ago started when his mother died of cancer. He was nine years old when she passed. He could remember praying to God for her to be healed, but 
she succumbed to her cancer regardless of his prayers. He was sent to boarding school after this. And uh, at boarding school, he was bullied. Uh, it, it bullied today in, in, uh, in, w- well, in ways that today would be considered criminal. In fact, uh, the head of his school, one of his teachers, uh, was later revealed was insane. He was, he was declared insane uh, not long after Jack left and the school had to be closed. But despite this, Jack's intellect thrived. He was very smart and soon he started to feel more sophisticated and intelligent and important than everyone he knew, and that included his own father. And so it wasn't long before this feeling of superiority crept into his religion, and by the time he was a teenager, he was calling himself an atheist. Well, years later, as he and his friend Ronald strolled along that night, he confessed to his friend Ronald that he actually really liked the story of Christianity. He really liked the Christian myth. He said reading the stories of Christ were like reading, quote, lies breathed through silver. Lies breathed through silver. In other words, all the stories struck him as make-believe. You know, they were all lies, but they were just the sort of lies one would wish to be true. The best of these, of course, would be the story of the resurrection of Jesus, which is where we're at today in John 20. How epic to imagine the Son of God dying for his friends, only to conquer even death itself mere hours later. How imagine, how, do, how sweet to imagine, too, that you could join Jesus in his resurrection, to think that you could be so connected to and associated to God's own Son that you'd be able to join him in being raised from the dead. And the price of this connection, the price of this resurrection, just believe just trust, just receive, just come to Christ with empty hands. Too good to be true, thought Jack. This is exactly what the story calls you to believe. And it doesn't read like a lie, a fable, or a legend. We know roughly the year in which this happened, where it happened, and the names of the people that were there when it happened. The story calls each of us earnestly and honestly to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the crucified and risen Savior and God of the world and that by believing in him, you can have eternal life. Let's look at the story now together. Starting in verse 1, chapter 20, we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. So, it's early morning, it's early Sunday morning, it's still dark outside, and Mary Magdalene, who is one of Jesus' most loyal and faithful followers, visits Jesus' tomb. Contrary to wild speculation or just plain lazy scholarship, uh, we don't know much about Mary uh, beyond the fact that she'd been miraculously and powerfully delivered from severe demonic oppression uh, by Jesus and had subsequently become one of Jesus' closest followers. Unlike the Pharisees who knew everything, or the Romans who could buy anything, Mary knew what it was to be truly helpless and needy. To have a life that was totally out of control, to be suddenly taken a hold of and plucked out of her living hell, 
many of us probably can't even imagine how much Mary loved Jesus and how grieved she was to be visiting his tomb after how he had so loved her. When she realizes the stone's been rolled away, she assumes that Jesus' body has simply been taken, stolen probably by Jews. And this is how she reports the story to the rest of the disciples in verse 2. Peter and John are the only ones that are named there. Uh, Actually, John's not even named. John identifies himself likely as the disciple whom Jesus loved. They run to the tomb, see this for themselves. There's speculation that maybe John was younger than Peter, and so he outran Peter and reached the tomb first, maybe. Maybe he was younger, but maybe not. Maybe he was just a better runner. In any case, John stops short of going in, but Peter, in his customary boldness, barges right into the empty tomb and finds the grave clothes neatly folded in their place. As we read these first verses, it becomes obvious that no one saw this coming. No one expected Jesus to be raised from the dead. John gets a little credit here in verse 8 when it says that he saw and believed, but John is still honest enough to point out the fact that they completely missed the fact that the Old Testament scriptures predicted this all along. Though they were told, even by Jesus, to expect this, they did not expect it. They weren't prepared for this. And perhaps this is why they returned home in verse 10, and why in a moment we're going to see them gathered in hiding with the doors locked. Continue in verse 11 to find Mary still weeping outside the tomb. It says, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So at this point, Mary is back at the tomb. She's lingering. She's grieving. Notice that even when she sees two angels in the tomb, she's still operating under the false assumption that Jesus is still dead and that he's been taken and placed somewhere else. And then all of a sudden, she turns, and suddenly there Jesus is. Because of the darkness of the early morning, perhaps, or maybe she's just got eyes that are still full of tears. She doesn't recognize Jesus. She doesn't see that it's him, and so she basically talks to him the way she talks to the the angels. Where Where is he? Where have you laid him? Where has he gone? Where can I find his body? What ends her sorrow, ends her sorrow is so simple. Jesus calls her name. Jesus just calls her name, Mary. And when he says her name, she recognizes his voice, and she sees her Savior, her Lord. I wonder maybe if John highlights this particular detail because he remembers Jesus himself saying, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. In any case, this is a great example of the goodness and gentleness and personality of Jesus to reveal himself simply by calling his own by name. 
sweet comfort to know that your Savior and your King knows your name. Of course, in her joy, she clings to Jesus. And then there's this puzzling remark by Jesus uh, that she should not cling to him. There's loads of speculation about why Jesus tells her this. And I'm certainly not smart enough to unravel all the different opinions about why Jesus tells her not to touch him in that moment. But I think that considering the fact that this gospel records that there were many days after this that Jesus lingered and remained and, and taught the disciples and fellowshiped with the disciples before he ascended to the Father. I, I think it's probably safe to say that because there's a few days after this where Jesus is going to have time with Mary and have time with the other disciples, he simply tells her not to cling for the moment because they have time. He's going to be staying for a little bit and the time that they have now is time where she needs to go and tell everybody and, and gather the other disciples so that they can all be together. In any case, this is another sweet little detail, I think, concerning not only Jesus' love for Mary, but the reliability of the resurrection accounts. You see, in this culture, the, the testimony of a woman was worth nothing. The testimony of a woman was not even admissible in a court of law. But here, not only was Mary the one to discover the empty tomb in the first place, not only was she the one also to see the Lord Jesus first, she was the one who was sent to tell the others about it. So apparently Jesus thought her testimony was worth something. Apparently the earliest Christians were not fabricating this account because if they had fabricated the account, they would have selected two credible witnesses and written them into the story and and that's not what we read. Instead, the story was reported as it actually happened, that the good shepherd appeared to his own, and starting with Mary, calls them by name and begins gathering them together. Next, in verse 19, we read that on the evening of that day, that's that same day, that same Sunday, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Another indication that this was not fabricated. They're willing to admit that even after the testimony of his resurrection, they're in hiding and fear. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So now when we meet the disciples here in this portion, we're told that they're hiding in fear. To their credit, at least they're not entirely scattered. Thomas is absent, but we get the impression that most of the rest of them are there together. They've been gathered together. Perhaps they're interviewing Peter and John about what they've seen, maybe discussing what Mary has said, or maybe John is even trying to convince them of what he's been persuaded by, that this has been a, a resurrection of sorts, at least maybe like what Lazarus experienced. Whatever they're talking about, we do read that they are concretely in fear of the Jews, and the doors are locked. And then again, suddenly Jesus is there. We don't know if Jesus simply had power over the door locks, we don't know if he passed through the walls. We don't know if the Spirit just suddenly made him appear there. We don't know. And John doesn't care to tell us how this metaphysically worked. He just tells us that Jesus defied the norm and was suddenly there. And when he is there, he takes away their fear. Many of you know what this is like, to think for a moment that God is really far from you. And then all of a sudden, he's just, he's just there. I didn't notice this till this morning. I was reading this again, and I found myself uh, continually saying to myself, oh, and then there's Jesus again. Oh, and there's Jesus again. And there's, he just keeps suddenly appearing. You're going to see it again in a moment. But many of you know what this is like. Think you have every reason to be afraid. think you have every reason to gather together your most trusted counselors to tell you how to deal with what you're afraid of. 
to think that it is on you to handle all of your problems. And then in his grace, Jesus suddenly is there and you're confronted with the reality that Jesus cannot be kept from those he loves. Now, the account of Jesus' appearance here is brief. His words are brief, and the brevity of the account leaves modern readers like ourselves with some questions. Maybe you had questions yourself when you noticed verse 23. He says to the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven, and if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, certainly that sounds strange to us. Anyone could see how it would or could taken the wrong way, lead to a cultish kind of Christianity where, where you must come to a particular kind of church or you must approach a particular kind of leader in order to be forgiven of your sins. This is where paying attention to the context helps us. Notice that this statement in verse 23 follows the language of being sent in verse 21. If you think about it, the text reads almost like a preliminary great commission. These, these men, these disciples, these believers who've just had their fear taken away and just had the Holy Spirit poured upon them are going to be sent. And they're going to be sent to preach and teach. And what are they going to be sent to preach and teach? They're going to be sent to preach that Jesus has died for sins. And he's been raised from the dead as the Savior and King of heaven and earth. That is their message. And here, Jesus is giving them authority to preach that message as if those who believe it will be forgiven. And preach that message as if those who don't believe it will remain in sin and condemnation. I I think that's the context. That's the sense of this word in verse 23, that as Believers in Christ scatter to the ends of the earth and preach a Jesus crucified and risen for sinners there to do it with the authority of the King of heaven and earth himself and preach as if it is the only way to be reconciled to God and forgiven of their sins. Time fails us to go into more implications of this incredibly packed verse, but I think it is a good reminder for our stubbornly independent age that Jesus here gives his church very real authority on earth. To put it another way, I think this little verse 23 taken again in the context of John, taken in the context of of all of the New Testament is indicating that the disciples of Jesus who have united together and gathered together under the authority of the risen Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, rightly baptizing, rightly administering the Lord's Supper, rightly preaching the Word of God, rightly applying the Word of God, they do in fact have authority from the Lord here on earth. That we as believers under biblical leadership, under the authority of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, baptizing disciples in the name of Jesus, renewing our covenant with one another through the Lord's Supper, have an actual authority on earth to represent the risen Jesus and call people into his kingdom. This is why your faith, by the way, should be lived out in the context of submission to a local body of believers. It is arrogant for you to go around the world telling people whether or not their sins are forgiven. But it's not arrogant for you to do that if you are being held accountable to a body of believers that are operating under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So there you go. There's my plug for church membership. We can move on now. Verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have 
believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So here John sums up his gospel. Jesus is Christ, which means he is the Savior of the world. He's the King. He's God's chosen, saving King. And Jesus is the Son of God, which means that Jesus is God. He's the same as his Father. All that is true of God is true of the Son. And so Jesus is Savior and God of the world. And all that is in here in this gospel culminates in this chapter and calls you to believe in Jesus as the only God who saves. Thomas's story, it fits here as an example of that very call. Jesus says to Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas is certainly an example of the right response when he says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Thomas is, just, Thomas is not just having an emotional exclamation here. He's not saying that into thin air. He is looking at Jesus and saying to Jesus, the text is clear, he said it to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So Mary gets it, disciples get it, Thomas gets it. The right response to Jesus of Nazareth is to fall at his feet and call him Lord and God and find that doing so gives you eternal life. So there are three reasons I want to give you in response to this story. Three reasons to believe in Jesus as the only God who saves. Maybe you're like Ronald's friend Jack that I told you about in the beginning. All this sounds fine to you. Great story, but maybe too good to be true. My prayer for you is that you'll see something here that's worth believing. Or... Maybe you do believe. Maybe you do. But there are still times where it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Sometimes you feel like a broken soda machine, right? You ever had that experience? You, know, you plug the quarter in and the pop won't come down? I don't know if anybody uses pop machines anymore, come to think of it, but you know, it's children of the 80s, we remember, right? You plug the quarter in and there's that moment of suspense. <laughs> it was like, is it going to drop? Right? And then what happens when it, when it doesn't drop? What do you do? Right? You bang on that thing until that soda drops like it's supposed to. But sometimes that's the way you feel, right? You feel like, yeah, I got it. The doctrine's in. Right? The quarter went in. Maybe I need somebody to pound on me or something because it just doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like it's making much of a difference. If that's you this morning, I, I pray that you'll see something in this text that will beat on you and Make the soda drop. In any case, no matter where you're at, here are the three reasons. First reason to believe in Jesus as the only God who saves is that belief is fundamentally human. Belief is fundamentally human. If you, maybe we don't think about this much because it's not that ordinary to think about what makes you human. Um, you know, you're fish in water. You don't think much about the fact that you're wet. But what does it mean to be human? There's actually quite a variety of opinions about this, competing opinions about this. Maybe our freedom is what makes us human. It certainly seems that some people believe freedom is what makes us human, that freedom is a unique and special expression of our humanity. For example, if some people are denied even a right that's imaginary, we will fight for that right, like our very humanity depended on it. Back in March of this year, for example, a TV personality named India Willoughby filed a criminal complaint with the police against author J.K. Rowling, who's famously responsible for the Harry Potter series. And the complaint was that Rowling used her social media, social media account to intentionally misgender India Willoughby. So India wants to be called a woman, but India is actually a man. And whatever you think of J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling actually doesn't play those word games. Uh, she actually thinks men are men, and 
women are women. And so there was a big uproar that she be charged with breaking uh, UK laws about that sort of thing. Now, my point in sharing this story is actually not to make much of a comment on the issues of transgenderism. My point is that even when we are clearly wrong about something, if we think we should be free in a particular area, if we think we have a right, then we will fight to make sure that we have that right as if our very humanity is at stake. So is it freedom that makes us human? I don't think this is actually right. I, I don't think this is the thing that makes us, that is most fundamental in defining our humanity. I've noticed quite a few squirrels and rabbits running free in my yard who have no concern for borders, boundaries, or rules at all, and I'm pretty sure this doesn't make them human. So what does it mean to be human? Is it love? Is it language? Is it diversity? Is it marriage? Is it consciousness? What is it that is fundamental in defining our humanity. Of course, as Christians, we would say that to be human is to be created in the image of God. We're not self-existent. We're not free in the way that God is. We, rather, we have a, we have a subjection, a, a dependence on him to provide for us our heir. Say nothing of every other function in our body. We are creatures and image bearers. But I, I, would, I would go deeper than this. I would go further on this and point out that one of the ways that we bear the image of God is by believing. Okay, so in case I've lost you already, remember I'm, the point I'm making here is that belief is fundamentally human. One of the most human things you can do, one of the things that is most consistent with the nature that you have been designed by God to have is to believe. Just think about testimonies in this passage. Notice how it accentuates everyone's disbelief in contrast to reality. Mary visits the tomb assuming that Jesus is still dead. When the tomb is discovered empty, she assumes that Jesus has been stolen. Disciples hide in fear even when Peter and John have witnessed the empty tomb and Mary testifies to have seen him. And Thomas refuses to believe until his own personal standards of proof are met. And, of course, none have accepted the testimony of the Old Testament scriptures that this would have to happen to the Messiah. I think the story of the resurrection presses all these examples of disbelief on us as a way of causing us to remember this fundamental human problem. We were made to believe God. We were made to believe his word, and we have fallen from that fundamental expression of our humanity. We have joined Adam and Eve in listening to that subtle accusation. Did God actually say? Did he really mean it when he said? Cynicism is not the default mode of man. Belief is. We were made to believe. Right? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are told, right, that they were made in the image of God. And what do we learn immediately after they were made in the image of God? That they were made to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He tells them. Right? Immediately after they're made in the image of God, we're told that they were given something to believe. Because they were made to believe. They were made to believe God and his word. And I, I don't know where each of you are at this morning, but I, I want you to try to see this with me, that disbelief is actually the explanation for most of our unhappiness. When we refuse to believe God, when we refuse to believe his word, we are denying something fundamental about who we are and what we were made for. It is disbelief and unbelief that is at the root of our dissatisfaction. The sexual diversity that we're seeing today, it's not happening because we finally figured out how to be content and satisfied. We have a glut of food expert shows showing you how to really make mac and cheese. Right? Here's how to really make barbecue. And there is a glut of those shows, not because we have finally figured out the secret of satisfaction and peace 
and rest. Social media doesn't provide for you an endless stream of pointless and instantly forgettable content because mankind has learned to be happy. These experiments abound because we are restless, because in disbelieving God, we've denied our humanity and lost ourselves in a chaos of empty options. The ancient church father Augustine said it this way, You have made us for you, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And so we are called to believe Jesus, to entrust ourselves to him as Lord and God and Savior and friend, and believe him. Believe him when he says to leave your sins and come follow me. It is the most human thing you could do. That's the first reason to believe in Jesus as the only God who saves. Here's the second. To believe is to have eternal life. To believe is to have eternal life. Verse 31, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let me just take you on a survey of John's gospel. Lest you have forgotten what this churchy phrase means. John is really concerned that you see this. He's really concerned that you understand this. And have this eternal life. So John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, okay? So eternal life is the opposite of perishing. But what, is, what does that mean? Well, John defines perish in verse 36 of John 3 when he says that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. The wrath of God remains on him. So we're told here that to have eternal life is to pass from a state of judgment and a place of guilt and condemnation into a state of approval and acceptance and freedom forever. Sounds like a good reason to believe. To be free of judgment and guilt and condemnation. Jesus says in chapter 4, verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So here, eternal life is being described not so much as a freedom from condemnation, but actually satisfaction. To have eternal life is to be satisfied forever, satisfied by what Jesus gives and satisfied by Jesus himself. That sounds like a pretty good reason to believe. Verse 36. This one was new to me, landed new on me this week. Already, 436, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Now, what that's describing there is, is, is sower being on the mission of spreading the message of, of Jesus to the ends of the earth, and, and the reaper, I think God or, or, or Jesus, gathering in all the fruit of that sowing, bringing the sower in, and then rejoicing together. And so eternal life here is said to be an experience of having joy with God forever. God will be with us, and together we will rejoice. Be honest. Have you ever, ever, at any point, maybe repeatedly, fantasized about meeting somebody slightly famous? You know, an admired sports figure, an admired author, an admired actor, an admired politician. I don't know, somebody famous that you just don't have access to, somebody you admire that you just don't have access to. Do you ever find yourself fantasizing about what it would be like to just have an audience with him for a few minutes and tell him just how great your appreciation is for them? I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one who imagines this, but how much more incredible would it be to have an audience with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and find that actually he wants to rejoice along with you?
Jesus prays this way in John 17:3 that eternal life is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so eternal life there is a picture of satisfaction and rejoicing in what God has accomplished. And what God has accomplished in you. A couple more examples. These are probably the most obvious ones. In 640, Jesus says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. I'll raise Him up on the last day. In 1028, He speaks in a similar fashion. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Eternal life in these verses is maybe the first thing we think of when we think of the idea of eternal life. Simply to be raised from the dead like Jesus was. To have new bodies. New bodies where rather than losing our humanity, we, we, we gain more of it. We, we get restored and made to be the way we were supposed to be. And, and not only that, no one's able to take it from us. We won't be able to die again. No one will snatch us from God's hand. Our eternal life is secure in a renewed and restored creation. Sounds like a good reason to believe. And here's, here's the last one. If you're wondering what difference this makes now. Jesus says in 524, Truly I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he, note the past tense, has passed from death to life. Eternal life apparently is something you can taste in the present. To believe is to have eternal life, certainly that you will taste in the future, but it is also to have passed from a state of death to life even now. In other words, you are more alive now than you were when you did not believe. Alive to the pleasures of God, alive to obedience, alive to grow and change and mature, alive to say no to sin and yes to God. And for all these reasons, we're called to believe this eternal life is all of these things. So brothers and sisters, I, I would apply this to your lives today by saying this. That this means that your labor is not in vain. That your work for the Lord is not in vain. If you want the, the, the longest commentary in the New Testament on the resurrection of Jesus and what it means for you, 1 Corinthians 15 would be the place to go. You want to know what the resurrection of Christ was all about and wh what it means for you, then 1 Corinthians 15 is the place to go. And this is the sum of Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians 15. After 57 verses on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how believers will join him in that resurrection, Paul says, Therefore, all your efforts are not in vain. They will bear fruit. You know what I think one thing in eternity is going to happen? You know what I suspect our experience or a part of our experience in heaven, whether they say the new heavens and the new earth will be like? I think it will be a celebration of all the ways God brought fruit out of all the obedience and faithfulness that you thought was pointless. I'm talking about the kind of faithfulness that stays with a spouse even when it seems like it's not working. I'm talking about the kind of faithfulness that continues to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray for that lost family member that seems impossibly far from Christ. Kind of faithfulness that prays and prays and prays for them, even though it doesn't seem to be doing any good. I'm talking about the kind of faithfulness that continues to extend grace and kindness and love to those who never give it back, never return it. I think because your labor is not in vain, eternity will be an experience of you discovering that not only was all of that obedience not in vain, but also you rejoicing with God over the fruit that he produced from it. I think we will be gathered to the Lamb and his throne 
and there will be a display of all the times in which you thought your obedience made no difference under the sun. And Jesus will look you in the face. And he will say, let me show you what I did with it. Seems like a good reason to believe. Finally, the third reason to believe in Jesus is the only saving God is that to believe is to have great joy and peace. Great joy and peace. Would, who would not want the joy of Mary clinging to her Savior's feet? Who would not want the joy of the disciples locked and afraid in a room and then all of a sudden Jesus is there? Who would not want the joy and the peace of Thomas who refused to believe and then to put his hands in the wounds of his Savior and rejoice. Jesus appears to his disciples in 21 and 26. He says, Peace be with you. How sweet to hear from the words of to hear from the mouth of the God of the universe, you and I are at peace. Consider the foundation of this joy and peace. Consider the foundation of this joy and peace. We know that the foundation of the disciples' joy and peace in those moments, it wasn't that they'd be able to go on physically clinging to Jesus. He told them, I'm ascending, it's coming. We know that wasn't the foundation of their joy and peace. We know that the foundation of their joy and peace wasn't that their troubles were over. They would go on being persecuted. They'd go on being mocked and imprisoned and hunted and criticized and many of them executed. So the foundation of their joy and peace wasn't that life was going to be cozy. Rather, the foundation of their joy and peace was that their greatest trouble had ended. The work of salvation was done, that as Romans 4.25 says, Jesus had been delivered up for their trespasses and raised for their justification. There's another churchy word for you, justification. It just means not guilty. In the scandal of the ages, guilty sinners get connected to Jesus, who is now raised and standing actually seated at his father's right hand so that should any accusation rise to the ears of the father, Jesus is there to stand up and say, no, 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 no. I died for that one too. That's the foundation of our joy and our peace. I think too there's a joy of expectation built into this as well. Surely yet another reason for the joy of Christian disciples is the joy of knowing what's to come. There will be a day when we are allowed to cling. We'll see the Lord face to face. We'll see lost loved ones face to face, all made new. We will be with the Lord and every tear will be wiped away. So, in closing, let me apply this to you two ways. Number one, let us practice this joy. And let us practice this peace in weekly worship for as long as we are able. I think there's a not-so-subtle reference, two not-so-subtle references to these things all taking place on the first day of the week, Sunday. There's at least two verses in here that reference that this took place on the first day of the week on Sunday. The book of Acts is also clear that the resurrection of Jesus on a Sunday signaled a change in the history of God's people. Sunday was the day of Jesus' resurrection and was recognized as the inauguration of a new creation. And so they actually moved their Sabbath to Sunday. When was the last time you heard about a church making a decision that fast? It's okay. Okay to laugh at yourselves, okay? Like we like the slowest people on earth, right? What, what color should the carpet be? Well, let's form a committee, right? Take forever in church, but 
resurrection of Jesus Christ was so certain and so conclusive and so controlling that they thought, worship on Sunday now? Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. Everything has been made new. Let's commemorate by gathering on Sunday. I don't think it's the main point of what John is getting after, but I think he mentions it to remind believers this is why you gather on the first day of the week. You gather on the first day of the week because Jesus was raised and reigning and ruling at his Father's right hand. So every day, every Sunday, is Resurrection Day. And when we gather for Resurrection Day, we are telling the world around us who the King really is. Don't underestimate the evangelistic power of just gathering with other believers on Resurrection Day. That's the first takeaway. Let me give you the second. It is to simply set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above. Here's what I mean. Here it is in a nugget. The reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is more real than your problems. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is more real than what is burdening you today. Don't underestimate the power of meditating on the truth of Jesus' resurrection in order to have joy and strength in your daily walk. When today's problems are long forgotten, Jesus will still be alive and reigning at his Father's right. All right, so you may have wondered uh, when I started us off this morning how Ronald answered Jack's questions. How did Ronald answer Jack's accusations that stories like the story of the resurrection of Jesus were just lies breathed through silver? Or maybe you already know what Ronald's response was because you figured out already that I'm actually talking about C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien who went by the names of Ronald and Jack to their closest friends. Well, Ronald's answer to the man who would become one of the greatest apologists in the 20th century was essentially this. He said to Jack basically this, you know, Jack, the very fact that you want this to be true is actually the strongest hint that it is true. Ronald suggested to his friend that maybe the reason Christianity felt like a myth to Jack was that all the other myths were copying the very story that God was telling in actual history. On that fateful night as they were having this conversation, Jack had actually abandoned atheism and was willing to accept that there was a God. And so Ronald suggested to his friend that maybe God was good enough to make the greatest myth of all time actually come true in history. And that suggestion was the beginning of the end of Jack's disbelief. From there, the floodgates opened, and there was no closing them. He would go from there to know what so many have discovered before, to know what so many of you have discovered. To believe is to have life. To have life eternal. Let's pray. Our Father in God, we want to give ourselves to you now in the name of Jesus, remembering his death, rejoicing in his resurrection and celebrating the salvation you accomplished in these great things. Work in us all that needs to be worked as we proclaim this message together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Benediction is from 1 Timothy. Chapter 6, verses 13 through 16. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. 
to him be honor and eternal dominion. And all God's people said, yeah. you are dismissed.